we've all felt this, right? Um, our boss sits us down and says, hey, uh, I've been looking at the numbers and it seems you are deficient. You know, in so many words, they say this. Uh, I noticed looking at the numbers, looking at my computer, that you are deficient. Uh, how in the world can my boss know that I'm deficient by looking at numbers? The metrics are fine, but leaders have to have to extract the stories behind the numbers, the stories, the human side of the numbers, the stories that the numbers are saying. In research, academic research on exit interviews is the number one reason given by employees of why they quit. Their boss. You got it. Not their leader. They never say my Not leader. leader. That's right, their boss. Today, in the great resignation period we are going through, that is the main reason for people quitting. We don't need to manage them. Hmm? We need more and more workforces that are self-managing, especially in the remote environment. Then we need managers who manage, direct, control, supervise, micromanage. Leadership in the digital age, the leaders have to think self-transcendence beyond myself. Even the lowest position are knowledgeable. Uh, are knowledgeable about their job, but their thing. All you have to provide, the leader has to provide the right direction. Hmm? And then I have the right people, the right talent, who by themselves get the job done. The leaders empowering people more, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. delegating more, making people feel they are making a difference, okay? And working as a team. That's why the coaches get together and huddle and rah, 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 and they are, whoa, make a shout and they go out on the field, right? All pipe pumped up. Greetings and welcome to the New World of Work podcast. This is your weekly podcast and today we've got episode number nine. So here we talk about people, leadership in a digital age. And today's topic is going to be the changing nature of employee relations and working conditions. So, so I'm here together with uh, Professor Bill Garrison and Dr. Bob um, Biswas. And we're going to have a lively discussion with what's been happening with the nature of work and how have we motivated our employees throughout the many years. So as a, well, let me just open it up to the team and uh, you guys can just start talking about, uh, you know, past and, and where we're going in the future. Now I'll kick it off with my icebreaker question to the two of you. Why do we need bosses? Why do we need managers? Why? In this day and age, digital age, information age, why do we need to be managed in a knowledge economy where we are all knowledge? Why? I look at my boss at the university. Why do I need him? But Dr. Bob, that's an excellent question. I, I will tell you, though, not everybody is as smart as you are. And not everybody's the same. So we have different levels of employees, right? So we have employees that, that are that's that are task oriented you know they do a specific task every day and they need to, that supervision to tell them what needs to get done that day but then we also have a different type of employees we've got the thought leaders and the innovators that's where i kind of question you know what kind of leadership do they need but the ship's got them all moving in the same direction so uh we do need our leaders to to get us all going in that same direction i i think you need I, a leader uh, hey bob you you said very very important words here you said you need a leader i asked you do you need a manager well you, you, you know got what steve Cully says managers manage is in the thick of thin things thick of thin things all micromanaging things things do this do that Hmm? Leaders lead people, okay? 
I didn't say we don't need leaders. I said, why do we need managers? If you also look at the derivation of the word manager, I looked it up one day. It's a French word, comes from the word person who took care of horses. <laughs> hmm? That's the original word. <laughs> I had no idea. Derived. That's funny. Of the word. So I think we need leaders, and that is why our title has this byline saying people leadership, not people management, not human resource management, but people leadership. And that is the main thing we need to understand that this day and age, where people are all very highly skilled knowledge and we are seeking these highly skilled, highly knowledgeable workers in the digital age. We don't need to manage them. Hmm? We need more and more workforces that are self-managing, especially in the remote environment. Then we need managers who manage direct, control, supervise, micromanage. Yeah, I think in our in our book we uh, this is a term you gave me to play with as we wrote several of these chapters. This term, boss subordinate relationship, and I, it 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 rubbed me the wrong way when I saw it written out. Boss subordinate because mm -hmm. I don't want to think of myself as subordinate to anybody, and I surely, as a people leader of the people that I get the opportunity to lead don't want to have them call me boss, right? I don't want to be their boss. My If I'm the boss, that means I know what they need to do and I'm going to tell them what to do. And if they need anything, they better come to me because the, I'm the one that has all the power. Hey, Bob and Bill, I asked my students this question. So I'm going to ask you, what do you think in exit interviews when personnel... HR, de <clears throat> HR departments con when a person when he quits voluntarily, they do an exit interview and they ask the reason why they're quitting. What do you think in research, academic research on exit interviews, is the number one reason given by employees of why they quit? Their boss. You got it. Not their leader. They never say my Not leader. Their leader. That's right. Their boss. Today, in the great resignation period we are going through, that is the main reason for people quitting. They don't want to be managed. It is not necessary to manage because with internet technology, emails, uh, Zoom calls, etc., you know, you don't have to. As Steve Curry says, managers manage things. And people and leaders lead people. Okay, we not don't need people to manage us on the things, hmm? which lands up being leading to micromanaging. Okay, and people, in my experience in HR, people don't want to be micromanaged. So, Dr. Bob, what do you think in the current environment? We use a lot of project management and we use the matrix system, right? So you've got a project manager managing the overhead the, the, the project and the task divvied out to the right employee in the right department. They're not their manager, but they're leading the project. They're called project right. managers. What do you what do you think about that? I think that's very appropriate. I always tell my students, you know, that when you are born, you have two bosses. <laughs> Do you realize you have two bosses when you were born? Your mother and your father. Okay. And oftentimes the mother and the father gives different instructions. Hmm? So from the time you were childhood child, you had to deal with that dichotomy of from the manager, father saying something, mother saying something else. <laughs> So matrix management is basically two bosses. You know, one is a project boss, the other is a functional boss. Uh, I don't like the word boss, leader. Let's replace the word boss to leader. 
functional leader and a, a project leader. Hmm? And you, the modern employee, the knowledge employee, is self-motivated individuals. Highly skilled, self-motivated, highly knowledgeable. Even the lowest position hmm, are knowledgeable. Uh, are knowledgeable about their job, their thing. All you have to provide, the leader has to provide the right direction. Hmm? And then hire the right people, or the right talent, who by themselves get the job done. You don't have to check in on them, have staff meetings and this and that. Just to tell the employees, hey, to tell our listeners, I have always believed this. So when I was a boss, vice president of HR, I used to call a staff meeting four o'clock on uh, Thursday or whenever. And my staff would come into my office and sit and they would expect I would go over work and things like that, right? Projects mm -hmm. and works. I asked them, okay, guys, start laughing. <laughs> and I said, ha, 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 ha. And the staff would laugh, correct? Mm -hmm. They will all laugh based on my cue. Mm -hmm. You think I was, I was making a joke or doing comedy? That was a serious act, okay? You know, the research shows when employees laugh, the right chemicals come into the body. Hmm? People relax, they become more productive, etc. Hmm? So this laughing therapy, I would conduct laughing therapy. Hmm? That was leadership. I was not talking about the micromanaging and the thin of thin things. I was getting, leading them and getting them in the right frame of mind. By the way, this practice, non-HR employees will walk by and they'll hear a whole bunch of laughing coming from HR. They'll come in and see what the hell is going on. They're all laughing. Why? And they'll come in and join in laughing. Okay? <laughs> then the whole company would be laughing. Yeah, me laughing become now. more productive. More productive. Well, I, was, I was thinking about this as I heard you the last several episodes talking about industrial revolution and the, um, just the, the history of HR where the bosses started realizing as the, the workers um, became more sophisticated that we got to do something to motivate employees and, and motivate the workers and psychology got involved. And just like you're saying, you know, the HR department's they think about how do we get more out of people. And so these psychologists offered up these theories right along the way of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I, I won't go into too much information here, but um, in chapter five of our book, we, we kind of lay these out. But just understanding the employee a little better, uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs does just a quick, all the bottom things need to be satisfied before they can move up. So if someone might have a bad day. We should probably be understanding of that equity theory. Um, inputs should match the outputs and uh, Herzberg's two factor theory. There's things that motivate our employees and things that demotivated them. And, and for some people, their companies haven't done any sort of these things yet. Here's another three expectancy theory is as an, a worker, I come into work, expecting if I put in effort, I'm going to get something back. And when that's off, that demotivates me. Goal setting theory is really more modern where I sit down with my manager and we discuss our goals together. And that leads to my performance, which leads to my rewards. And it's a circle. And self-determination theory is really, um, we're starting to notice, as you mentioned at the beginning, Dr. Bob, leave the workers alone and they might actually be more productive. Allow them to teach themselves, allow, allow them to have purpose in their jobs. And we don't have to sit there and supervise them, you know, all the time. So these were ways I, we tried to, the to improve the boss relationship, right? I think Bill, you just said it. If you go back to the previous slide, this, the theory slide, please. And uh, 
the last two uh, theories here, goal setting theory and self determination. Uh, oftentimes, self determination theory is called self efficacy theory. And this is basically leadership theories and that seem to me apply to the modern uh, digital age, self efficacy theory, which is the boss, you know, the best way to deal, deal with a uh, explain self efficacy is when an uh, athletic team hmm, is about to go into the field, they huddle and the coach is there also, the leader is there. And they say words of encouragement to each other and in the huddle, ra ra ra, whatever, <laughs> and they pump themselves up. Okay, that's self-efficacy theory. Okay, so you can see in this modern world, digital age, more self-efficacy is necessary. You know, the leaders empowering people more, hmm? Hmm? delegating more making people feel they are making a difference okay and working as a team that's why the coaches get together and huddle and, rah, 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 and they are, Whoa, make a shout and they go out on the field right all pipe pumped up that's self-efficacy motivation okay i think that seems to me those th two theories actually goal setting goal setting is management by objectives okay so Bob will be highly motivated if his if his leader sets objectives. They jointly set their objectives. Okay, together both boss, leader, and subordinate has the input into the objectives, and the Bob has to see whether he has to clearly see the line of sight on the objectives. He has to, in his own mind, think, okay, the Leader set this objective for me. Can I achieve this objective? Is it possible? Do I have the resources to complete this objective? Mm. Okay. And if I complete the objective, am I going to be rewarded? Okay. So that's a management of my objectives. So it seems to me these modern motivation theories are more applicable in the digital age than. Abraham, Abraham Maslow's theory of hierarchy of needs. I have always had a problem with that theory. By the way, <laughs> Abraham Maslow in his late years, he landed up in a mental asylum. Did you know that? He landed up in a mental asylum. He did not know that. He's, uh, I always, uh, you know who Deepak Chopra is? Hmm? Yes, Deepak. Self. Mm -hmm. yeah. He was giving a speech and uh, the Q&A put up the hands and he was talking about Maslow's hierarchy of needs and the ultimate lead is self-actualization hmm? in Maslow's. I put up my hands and I asked Deepak Chopra, Dr. Chopra, what about self-transcendence? People who have made the most significant contributions to the world are self-transcendent beyond themselves. Not me, 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 me actualization. So Abraham Maslow missed one level completely. Hmm? So these are old theories of motivation. <clears throat> MBO, self goal setting and self efficacy, self determination seem to be more appropriate to the modern digital age. I, I think of myself as a as how I the different positions I've been a leader. Um, and I was thinking back to your original question, why do people need me as their boss, right? Um, and I almost took the bait. I said, well, it's because I have information they don't. And I have, my boss has information and they can look at things at a lot bigger level. And maybe the people that I, I'm in charge of, uh, don't. they have their own ideas of what they ought to do, but I need them to do what the organization needs them to do. So <clears throat> I could manage them and take their whole personality out of it, take their whole, uh, they're having a bad day and just demand, uh, since I'm their boss, that they do it, do it today, do it now, and let me know when it's done, right? And 
that's uh when I've done those types of things, it's never worked out well. But I found that when I understand them, get to know them personally, understand their strengths and weaknesses, I play to their strengths. I try to set them up for success and kind of if they have a task they need to do, I make sure they have the tools they need to do it. And so they I've had a lot of feedback uh, from people that I've led that they really enjoyed working with me, not working for me. As I, as I t- think and opine on this issue with you guys, two guys, my partners, I think more and more leadership in the digital age, the leaders have to think self-transcendence beyond myself, self-efficacy, okay? Because you manage the people, leaders do not have more information than the lowest level worker. They do not. They think they have, they do not. And some leaders like Jim Senegal, founder of Costco, have you ever have you seen his video on YouTube? Hmm? Bob? I have not. You need to see the video about him. This is a leader. CEO, and he built a company that is $50 billion now, world's largest distributor of wine in the entire world, okay? Hmm? Costco sells more wine than anybody else in the whole world. So he built that company. And what he, do, what he did when he went visited stores, he didn't go to the store manager's office and sit in a fancy office. He went down to the warehouse, and he worked with the warehouse people to load shelves, etc. That's where the information comes from. The hierarchy, the higher levels do not have the information. That's why you have the TV show Undercover Boss. Hmm? If you see this TV show, every one of those boss that goes undercover in a disguise come up better human beings when they relate to the real people. Okay. So I think the thesis we are I'm suggesting that in this digital age where information is abundant, its leadership is more important than managing. And lots of companies have recognized that. That's why they're removing layers of management, you know. Manager one, manager two, manager three. We don't need manager one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. Hmm? We need a few leaders who who create self-efficacy motivation, empowers the self. I've talked too much, right? <laughs> well, I with what you said, I, I think of a leader also as somebody who's got who's got the wisdom. And there was a philosopher back in the uh, 1780s. His name was Sir Francis Bacon. And he, and he basically said that knowledge is power. And that is true. Knowledge is power, but only when you know how to use it. Right? It's, and it's through education that you gain knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. And so knowledge is basically the information. And understanding the comprehension of that information. And wisdom is knowing how to apply that proper information. So wisdom is what the leaders have. So he went. So the guys from guy from Costco went, and he got the knowledge down by going to the loading docks and talking to uh, the technicians and and uh, the people that work in the back. But he then used wisdom to apply that knowledge, and then so that's he walked the why talk. he's a leader. Yeah, he walked the talk, Bob. If you see his video, this guy is a simple man was a simple man. He's not the CEO anymore. Very simple man. He came up from the ranks, you know. Harvard and other university scholars have done research on leadership. And it has been shown that people who usually come come from humble beginnings make better leaders, okay? Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't think my our listeners are going to get a, a shot from the next statement I make. I don't think these fancy business schools like Harvard and Wharton and Sloan creates any leaders. You know, 
leadership is the art of leadership is the art of the unknown okay mm. it's <clears throat> your character your principles okay that people want to emulate not your not getting more information from you information can be derived from many sources today not from the in manager okay so i think this digital age what this chapter is all about is creating leadership hmm? people leadership yeah this is what the whole book is about right bill yeah and i i you know robert was talking about the role of the leader is to make sure the ship's going in the right direction and what you're just saying is that uh the leader's job is primarily you know you want to produce for the organization you need to to make sure the ship's moving in the direction that it needs to move but the leader encounters all sorts of things right uh the if the titanic knew there was an iceberg coming they would have turned away from the iceberg they wouldn't stay on the same path um but they didn't know it was coming and so there is all sorts of things that are the day-to-day -day grind that leaders um and people that have the role of manager have to keep people motivated so it's not a grind and then wild stuff comes out of nowhere right um so we have in the digital age the four forces we've talked about before these massive uh obstacles and challenges and things like that so we we simultaneously need to make sure that people aren't getting bored and want to move on but then while uh, and and we know that the working conditions could be very um satisfactory but then other things like pandemics come involved so we talk about in this chapter the current working conditions and it it could have been a chapter by itself we have you know the the role of the unions in osha right now very um a lot of information that's got us to the point where we're at today and i think in the as the internet came around and and moved us um forward computers started giving managers dashboards um and so now instead of uh what i was taught when i was younger is that you get your clipboard and you manage by walking around so it's not a ipad but rather i have a clipboard so i could write stuff down as i'm going around like the ceo of costco you're talking about but i need to go out and be in it so i could see what's going on um and so these software companies created these management dashboards that now as a middle manager or top manager i can just sit at in my cushy office at a computer screen and push buttons and push this button i fire that guy i push this button i get more improvement here and we act like we're the wizard of oz uh behind the curtain trying to run these things uh and that leads to what's the author's name dr bob of tyranny of the metrics what's his I don't name remember the author's name i have it in my library if you want me to get get up and find it yeah i'll, I'll introduce the book the concept of it if you can find the author's name um it, it the idea is that uh we've all felt this right um our boss sits us down and says hey uh i've been looking at the numbers and it seems you are deficient you know in so many words they say this uh i noticed looking at the numbers looking at my computer that you are deficient uh, how in the world can my boss know that i'm deficient by looking at numbers <laughs> right but it's so appealing to managers and to companies mm -hmm. to have this efficiency that i don't have to walk around yeah bill i so agree with you i was director of it for numerous companies in southern california and dashboards were really popular that's one of the things we did in it is create the dashboards so we built those dashboards after after sitting down with the executives and finding out what the key performance indicators were but by doing the dashboards on a daily basis we had daily weekly monthly dashboards with the with the kpis key performance indicators and then with that the different district managers the different managers they were able to uh the groups were able to manage themselves 
because everybody saw the same information and they were compared to the other locations. So, as you said, the leader could sit back in the room and, and the place would start just managing itself because the information was there and available to everybody through the KPIs. So the dashboards were uh, pretty remarkable. And I, and I know it doesn't, it, it may work in some instances, right? You might get it right. But I remember playing fantasy football um, several years ago. If you don't know what fantasy football is, at the beginning of the NFL season, you and your friends get together and you pick a team of players from different teams, and then they get points each week for their performance. And so you're trying to basically create an all-star team that can beat your friend's all-star team. And sometimes you play for money or a trophy, but mostly it's for bragging rights. Mm -hmm. So I decided, hey, you know, I've, I know how to use Excel. I know how to do this. I'll put together a dashboard <laughs> uh, that just uses the numbers and it tells me who to draft. And I found that every time I used a dashboard to draft, my team was horrible because I wasn't <laughs> using my instincts at all. Um, and and we find that um, a lot of the times they don't let females into these leagues because uh, the reason is not machismo or, or any sexist reason. It's because the girls are better at it. They, uh, they're not emotionally attached to the, their players or their teams. And so they, they're able to take not only the numbers, but they sense things as well. And, and they, they put together um, non-NFL fans can tend to play that game better. And so just goes back to this tyranny of the metrics concept. Uh, Dr. Bob, did you get it? It's Jerry yeah, Mueller. Jerry Mu uh, his name is Jerry Mueller, M U. L L E R. Yeah. And and he was warning. In his book, he says, in the Tyrrhenia metrics, Jerry Mueller warns all leaders to be wary of overemphasizing data to make decisions slash set policy. He provides examples from medicine, the military, education, philanthropy to drive home the message that we often miss misuse data in a way that derails the mission of the organization. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, we're not and we're not suggesting throw out the dashboards, right? We're just saying use them as a data point. Right. We've evolved. I think the know. best way to explain this, sorry Bob, you wanted to say something. No, I was just saying that we've we've we're we're evolving, you know, from the dashboards, which was a good uh indicator of what was important, but we have to go beyond that in the digital world. Absolutely because I my take on this is metrics are fine, but leaders have to have to extract the stories behind the numbers, the stories, the human side of the numbers, the stories that the numbers are saying. It's just not Bill is my I lead Bill. I don't throw numbers at him. Hmm? But understand the stories. I see examples of this. Recently, in our Bob, in our region, hmm, my uh, our leader tells uh, the, our faculty hmm, to go and look at the pulse survey of the first three weeks. Uh, we, our university, does a quick and dirty student survey of what they think about the class and the leader and the professor, etc. And it boils it down to a score. Which is one through four. This new professor got the score hmm? 2.0 hmm? out of four, 50%. And she really threw an email right away. What is this all this about? I put in so much hard work, okay? Huh? And just two students fill in the survey and two, and then you're telling me to be more. You, the leader, telling me to be more vigilant. Hmm? So that is focusing on the numbers without the story behind it. That's the role of the leader, to extract the story behind the numbers, not just use the numbers as a hockey stick, a baseball bat on people, OK? So numbers are important, but it should be able to Decipher the story behind the numbers, okay? Then only 
will you get effective results from metrics? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then before, I, before the time runs out, I have to say this thing in my mind. Today, in this digital age, really, really, I see my voice is going up. We really have to have leaders who are self, self, who are so sure of themselves, they don't focus on their welfare, on what is good for them. Focus on big, huge compensation packages, etc. Not that. What they have to focus is on their st stakeholders. And that's why they have, we have uh, the advent of the new theory, which Bob must be an expert on. It's called servant leadership. Mm -hmm. The leaders have, right, Bob? You're an expert on that side. So, <laughs> right. You know, that's why this theory of servant leadership has come up because leaders have to understand all the way to top CEOs that you are not there for yourself. You are there for others. You have to put the interests of the others and sacrifice your own interests if you're going to be new, if effective leader in the digital age. Enough said, Bob. Bob I get out of their push. get out of their way and give them what they need. Exactly. That is all essential of serving leadership, right? What you just said. <laughs> Correct. Well, as we'll um, winding through this. Bill, did you have any uh, concluding thoughts that you wanted to mention with regard to where yeah. we're at with this? Yeah, I, I, I really think the the idea of the, the boss subordinate relationship, it, it's, I hope we can get past that term, right? And we can start to see that there doesn't need to be a hierarchy for the purpose of dividing, right? Uh, in fact, in, in this chapter, a concept uh, that I discovered was, uh, you know, you're just thinking about an org chart where it has the box with the line and then, you know, the several people that, that you serve. That line, that vertical line, will determine uh, how well that partnership is in the team atmosphere there. And so if you, you could have a hierarchy, um, that is fine. We're talking about flattening the organization, which means removing layers. But we should even uh, additionally, as individual people leaders, work to shorten that vertical line so that we bring ourselves closer and closer to those that we have the uh, opportunity to serve. Um, I, I find it a tremendous responsibility that when my organization says, I want you to be responsible for these five people or these 20 people. Uh, I take that very seriously because they're they're entrusting those um, people's lives in my hands. Their their livelihoods, um, while simultaneously helping out the organization, and so I need to get closer and closer that I can to my team, so I understand how to serve them the best. If you give me two seconds, I want to end my section by giving you the latest thinking in the digital age of strategic business model. In the past, because we were, the system was designed based on greed, profit, 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 shareholder welfare, shareholder satisfaction. With the influence of Wall Street, companies, corporations, focused on shareholder wealth maximization as the leading variable, correct? That is so wrong, <laughs> absolutely wrong. Why? If the, fo fo or, uh, the organization focuses on people, they are people, and they do everything possible to increase the welfare of people who are working as partners in that organization, and put the people first, People, satisfied people, satisfy customers. And satisfied customers increase your top line and your bottom line. So people are the leading variable of organizations. 
then comes customer and then comes the shareholder. They are the lagging variable. So the business Wall Street business model has, is really needs to be completely re rethought, okay, or re re-engineered to put people first. This is what the great resignation in the great resignation people are telling leaders. Leaders, put me first. If you put me first, then the customers will be satisfied. Then your shareholders will be satisfied. That is the change we are advocating in the book. And that is hopefully the change that will happen post COVID-19. Thank you very much. Dr. Bob, thank you. That was very well said. To put that in a summary, I think I would say that people leaders find ways to create partnerships between managers and workers. And I think both Bill would agree with that and Dr. Bob. So we want to we want to thank you. That concludes our episode podcast number nine. And we'll see you again next week. Everybody take care. Have a great week. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye bye.